How do you trust, you know, your fellow fighter pilots in your squadron? You train with them every day. It's one of the interesting things you can do once I've built this AI pilot, I can copy and paste it into an infinite number of platforms, whether it's virtual or live, and I can actually have that continuity of training and trust and that transferability into flight. I know what to expect, I know what it can do, I know what it can't do, I know how to interact with it at the right time, and so you develop your own tactics. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. Joining me in the Circle Air Group studios today is Mike Benitez. Uh, Paco is the call sign. And Paco, you've been on, let's see, you've been on the Afterburn Show. You've actually been on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, but by the authentic media episodes we've run. This is your first time on the actual show. Welcome. Thanks. It's a very meta being here now. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, good. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, man, of all the things, every time I listen to you somewhere, I'm like, golly, where did I fall off the train? Because this guy is like, you're very smart at a lot of things, it seems to me. <laughs> and so of all the different things we could talk about today, I thought we could talk about, and you tell me, uh, collaborative combat aircraft, loyal wingmen, I don't know, the drones that are going to maybe someday follow our manned fighters around. You know, a Coke is a soda. What do we call these things? Is there a generic name for them? I think right now CCA is the uh, is the acronym everyone's going to index on, okay. and so the Air Force leaned into it, so they're going to slap the table and call them CCA. All right, now. is that what we should use for today? For today, let's call them CCA. Okay, that works. It's, it's not quite as fun as Loyal Wingman, but again, if that's yeah. some particular brand, then we can stick with whatever the concept is. Okay. So. All right, good. Well, before we talk about CCAs, let's talk about Mike Benitez. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And what'd you do in the Air Force before getting where you are today? Born and raised in Florida. I uh, didn't know what wanted to do when I grew up. So I, I threw a rock at the hardest thing I could find and enlisted in the Marine Corps. Wow. Did that for about eight years, transitioned to the Air Force as an officer, spent another 17 or so years. So a total about 25 years of active duty. Most of that time as a backseater in the Strike Eagle. So I'm a weapons systems officer by trade, uh, weapons school grad, five combat deployments, a couple hundred combat missions, an extra combat tour in the Pentagon and Congress, if you want to count those as well. <laughs> uh, and then my last assignment was an operational test, testing future weapons and technology. Okay. Well, that explains why every time I hear you on a show, I'm just blown away because those are some real amazing experiences. And it sounds like, you know, you've, you've really kind of had your hand in a lot of different things. And I have to think I never did a tour at the Pentagon, but that probably exposes you to a lot of different uh, elements of this business as well. That's right. It is definitely, uh, you know, they call it the puzzle palace or the five-sided wind tunnel. It's a thing. It's yeah. a thing. So good okay. experience. Uh, don't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all right. So let's set the scene here because at least the careers that you and I had, I was usually single seat, sometimes a two-seat F-18 with someone like you in the back. You were F-15 strike eagles, you said? Yep. Okay. So at that time, right, uh, anyone who's familiar with this show, hopefully knows, like manned aircraft go out, particularly in training, we'll have manned adversaries as well, and we go after each other, we come back, we debrief it, and then we go to combat and ostensibly fight the way we train. And for the most part, although there are more and more unmanned aerial systems, I guess, is that where we've settled on those, UAS? Sure, we'll use that. Okay, let's go with that. <laughs> uh, and those are out, but they're, in my opinion, at least from what I can see, kind of doing solo operations, surveillance, maybe taking out uh, certain targets at times. But now, again, the topic for today is there's this concept or a possibility of maybe something is flying next to me in my Hornet or you in your Eagle, and it might not have someone in it, or maybe it's optionally manned. And I don't know, this is what I really want to know is, is it the thing shooting? Is it a bigger beacon? If I'm getting shot at, uh, what's it going to do? So, but let's set the table here. Where are we at today, early 2024 with this as a concept? I don't think we can really start there. I think you have to start uh, because we start talking about here's here's where we're at, here's where we're going. Okay. And in my experience, and I work for a defense tech company in this space for the past few years, so uh, I can tell you those conversations quickly pivot back to uh, things like trust and how do I know, what, how am I going to train with it, and all these other questions, and it really doesn't actually get at the topic. So it's kind of helpful to go back and set the stage. So if you zoom out, everything you just said, is exactly the same for the past like 70 years. Right. None of that's changed, right? The, from the, the training pipeline and we go out and do the mission, we brief, execute, debrief uh, in a manned platform, all that stuff, none of it's changed. But when you look at 
technology and really like, look at autonomy. So automation. So if you zoom out way back to the 1950s, you know, the Korean War was the first automated gun sight. And that's what actually gave the F-86 the advantage over the MiGs. And you fast forward and you go, the point of automation, we have automated shooting the gun to a point, right? Sort of. Then we have missiles. We have IR heat sinking missiles. So we've that point of autonomy is now in the missile itself. Then we change the seeker for radar. And when you look at just the point of autonomy over time, as technology advances and as the mission advances, the technology is going to advance with it. So the Super Hornet that you flew at the end of your career was probably nothing like the Super Hornet or even the Hornet if you were a baby Hornet guy in the beginning. It was. Yeah, same thing. Like you, yeah. you probably started with the legacy uh, APG seventy three radar. Sixty five. Sixty five, and yeah. then you retired with probably the ESA radar, right? Uh, that, and it was like cheating. Yeah, it was exactly. so good. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. So that's just one example of how like there is a technology that matures over time. Some sometimes in parallel, you don't even know that this technology is being developed in parallel until it's inserted into your platform, and now you're like, wow, I could not live without this. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about autonomy, it's kind of the same way. Like you said. When we went to Group 5 drones or UASs like the MQ-9, the MQ-1, so the, the Predator, the Reaper, you know, that was for you know, global war on terror, had a very specific role, and it was almost like bifurcated. Like it wasn't integrated into the joint force, really. It was kind of doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. The running joke, you know, they they put all this technology in the in the platform to connect back to the, the, the operator on the ground, but it only had one radio, so it couldn't really talk to anyone up in the air. And so you would just kind of stay away from it because you couldn't really truly integrate with it because mm -hmm. the GCS guy is, uh, you know, typing on his computer and he's back at, you know, Nevada or somewhere else. And so now you're looking at, as we can inject more and more mature software and autonomy into these vehicles, can we bring what it was traditionally kind of a segregated force and bring it together in a way that can actually solve some strategic problems? That's really what it all comes down to. And now how you do it and what it's going to do, that becomes the nuance. But if you don't understand the scene setter of how it is inevitable that these things are going to come together, and so saying that it's not going to happen or, or we're not going to do it, if we don't do it, guess what? Someone else will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so a lot to unpack there, but part of, first off, this is not an area of specialty for me. That's why I was gushing oh, over <laughs> all this for you. So I might ask some very basic questions, but already there was one word you used that I was surprised by, and that was strategic. I would have thought tactical. So I would have thought I want something that can help me maybe either stay alive in my F-18 or be more lethal, but you're talking about strategy. So is that deliberate? I mean, is this a bigger, like maybe taking on a certain peer threat over the Pacific, or are we just talking about being more lethal at a tactical level? Or there's maybe both. A, it's actually, there's actually three. There's a, there's a tactical level, there's okay. the operational level, and then there's a strategic level. Okay. So if we start at the operational level, I think it makes the most sense because then you can kind of zoom up, zoom out, and zoom in. Sure. So operationally, and you probably know this, plan lots and lots of strike missions over time. I've had the privilege of planning and executing large force packages and, and real-world operations against contested threats, uh, so not just dropping bombs in Afghanistan. And when you look at these real-world missions at a very high level of approvals and the, the process to vet those, someone is going to accept the risk, right? And so the commander... Typically, we talk about risk to force and risk to mission. Those are intrinsically linked. So when a commander is going to commit forces, he's committing people, mm -hmm. right? So his loss of life, and now that is how do I mitigate that risk? I need to invest in a CSAR force. So I need to deploy and have all of these things in play. And if that doesn't work, where's my backup plan? And where's the backup to the backup plan? Because I'm putting people in harm's way. It's been historically linked together. The commander, it is, it is a combined conversation. What if you could decouple those? So risk to mission and risk to force are now two different conversations. I don't have to commit a manned, a, a person in a fighter jet to go strike that target. I can put something that is fighter-like, but has the risk associated like a predator or a reaper. If you shoot it down, okay, I'm willing to accept the loss of this platform to execute that mission and meet that objective. And so operationally, that's really the value it provides. Now, tactically, there's all kinds of really interesting things you can do with it. <laughs> uh, but when you zoom out and you think strategically, if we do that, one of the byproducts of that, or the forcing function, depending on which way you're looking at it, is that these platforms, when you take the human out, inevitably, the platform becomes way cheaper. 
because the the systems that are designed to support the human, the uh, the pink body, that's that the stick wiggler, right, <laughs> in the jet, there's a lot of cost that goes with that, and it's not just the life support systems like the ejection seat and the cockpit. You know, that's eight to ten million dollars. Oh. I mean, you actually factor it all together. I only know that because when you look at the F-15EX, it was the single versus dual, two cockpit. There's a price associated, but anyways, we can talk about that later. <laughs> Flew the EX for a couple of years as well before I retired. Oh. So when you look at it, though, you go, okay, if I don't have to take the, the, the life support systems, take that out. And now I also don't need to build an aircraft that needs to last 40 years. Maybe it needs to last four years. I don't need to fly at 10,000 hours. Maybe it's designed to last 2,000 hours. Because of that, I don't need to have this, there's a tooth to tail, right? Mm. And a lot of platforms. I don't need to invest in the depots and the and all the phase maintenance and all of those things associated with, with keeping these platforms decades and decades in the air. Like, I don't need to do that. And so your cost, you'll see a lot of people talk about the cost of these things. We're probably in the third to a, a quarter of the price of like an F-35. So something in like the $20 million range or less, wow. you can do F-35-like things. For one F-35, I could buy, call it three or four CCAs, and they can do F-35-like missions. Now we're talking about affordable, intelligent mass. And that is the strategic value because now we can rebuild a force that we haven't had in a long time. Uh, for listeners who aren't aware, the, the Air Force itself, the running joke, it's the uh, oldest, smallest, and least ready that it's ever been. Oh, wow. And it gets worse every year. You don't fix that by just buying more of the same. You have to jump to a new paradigm. Yeah. And that's really why everyone is excited about this because it has st strategic impact. It has the operational flexibility. Like I said, there's some really interesting things when you get to nuances of tactics of how you can actually make that all work together. And that new paradigm, and that was what I was thinking before you said it, so I'll just uh, go with that. Is that because either we're just tired of doing it the same way or our appetite for human loss has so much less. I mean, think about June 6, 1944, right? Yeah. We're going to just send waves and waves of America's finest until someone gets through. Like, that's such a concept now that is so foreign, I can't even imagine <laughs> yeah. in that in, in 2024. So is it a fatigue issue? Is it a uh, just uh, some other issue? Or is it uh, where I'm getting at, and I think this is probably the answer, is it a technology issue? It's like, hey, sure, we would have loved to do this in the early 80s when they made the Terminator movie. They hinted at it because it's easy in Hollywood, but now maybe the technology really exists. Why now? Well, I'd say in the past probably 10 years in particular, the gaming industry. So computer games. Really? So NVIDIA is probably the biggest one. Their pivot from building computer processors into uh, GPUs, so graphic processors, to enable all the gaming that you see now. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. That's the same hardware that is used to build autonomy and artificial intelligence for air vehicles. So because the gaming industry has basically propelled the computing industry forward, it's allowed us to do these things. Now I have the tools. We advance the body of knowledge in math, because it's a lot of math. It's algorithms and mathematical equations. Combine it with, now we have the tools to do stuff with these equations. Kind of like the F-117. The F-117, the mathematical formula to make that work, it was uh, written by a, a Soviet, you know, you probably know the, the I story. I just finally read Skunk Works. It was oh, really great. Yeah, a Soviet researcher right. came up with it like 25 years, 30 years before Skunk Works ever even saw it. Mm -hmm. But Skunk Works had, had one thing going for me. It was translated by the Air Force, so they had the report, and then they had the early access to a computer to actually run the mathematical equations to make it real, right? So it's not just the autonomy. It's all the other things that have come to play in in the, in the national security environment the way it is, I think people are looking at seizing the opportunity that is kind of presenting itself from the commercial side. But couldn't that be adaptable to the fighter itself? I mean, why not just put that in the manned fighters and keep doing what we're doing? Because we'll get to in a moment the integration, right? I, yeah. I can't imagine these CCAs are just running around with pure autonomy. They're, as we talked about at the beginning, if they're going to be a loyal, quote, wingman, they're going to be near, arguably, a manned fighter. So why not just use that technology and maybe make our fighters better? Yeah, absolutely. And we should. And and to an extent, they are. From your day job, your, your airplane that you fly in your day job has a lot of automation. Oh, yeah. 
right? And it makes it very like, oh, I, my cognitive burden is is very low. I'm, I'm focused on the big picture so I can maintain my situation awareness. It's the same thing of how cockpits and fighters have evolved over time. The F-35 is a great example. So as a strike you guy, there's two people in the cockpit. You know, this is a 1980s design and the synergy of having two people in a cockpit when it works. Uh, mm-hmm. so I, sometimes it doesn't work. When you're jiving from the front seat and the back seat, one plus one equals three. That's the synergy you get out of it. There's a lot of information. Uh, there's you know, 30 pages of data that you're constantly trying to scroll through to make sense of what's going on in the environment. You have the communication between uh, the front and back seat. Well, in F-35, that's put behind the glass. And so it's a simplified, this is the thing. Here's how I know it's the thing. That cognitive burden has been shifted. That point of autonomy has shifted from uh, in front of the glass to behind the glass. Hmm. And it does have some automation and some autonomy for fusion, things like that. And I would argue that there are other things that you could do, and and you'll probably see some more things for F-35 in particular because it has the biggest investment going into it. But there is a point of diminishing returns. At the end of the day, something like an F-35, which is a great platform, it's it's always going to cost about the same amount of money because that's what it's going to cost to build it. It's this much size. It's only got this much range, this fast. Like these These are the aerodynamic limitations of the platform. It's physics, right? And so because of that program, while autonomy could help the F-35, and it will, I'm sure, it's not going to be that operational strategic level impact that we've been talking about. Hmm. That At the end of the day, that's where I kind of draw the line. Okay. So for these CCAs, are we thinking of them as being maybe attributable or expendable? Like, hey, if I go out today and I have maybe two of these with me, but I don't come back with any of them, and we already touched on, okay, yeah, it's like when you lose a Reaper or something, it's money, but it's not a human life. Is the thought being that we're going to build these to almost be like a toad decoy that some of our fighters already have? When you're done with it, you cut it off and it's gone? Or is it going to, from that point of view, kind of shift where we expect the battle damage to occur and and better protect humans? Or where are we thinking with that? Well, I'm an industry guy, so I'll leave that to the Pentagon to decide. (laughs) But but we do talk with them often. They're all thinking about the same things. At the end of the day... It's physics, right? So I could carry something, whether it's fuel or weapons, and fuel has mass and weight properties. Weapons have mass and weight properties, and that determines the size of the vehicle. The size of the vehicle determines the cost. The cost then determines what's my appetite for loss. Mm -hmm. It's almost circular in a way, right? Because like we could just take the fuel out of it. Well, then it won't go as far, and then I can't do the thing I want, but then it costs less so I can afford to lose it, but then it won't get to where it needs to go to do the thing. It's an interesting conundrum that the uh, the Air Force is working through right now. Uh, There's a couple things going on uh, inside the Pentagon for that. Well, where are we today? What types of vehicles are already either on the drawing board or maybe in the air? That's great. We actually didn't even talk about that yet. So that's a good uh, good segue. So if we back up, group five, there's five groups of UASs that the military calls. They have group one, two, three, four, five. One, uh, think about it as a quadcopter. Two, it really hasn't been used much. It was uh, like the MQ-8 Fire Scout, like your rotary wing stuff. Now it's kind of being taken over by air launched effects. So think kamikaze drones kind of thing. You have group three, which are like human size things. So, you know, 150, 200 pound kind of aircraft doing their thing. Then you have group four and group five. Group four is like your MQ-1. Uh, Group five is is large vehicle. And that's usually, we think, Global Hawk and MQ-9. This is a new generation of group five aircraft. And this is what we're calling CCAs. So these are not long endurance. When you look at those, they have long skinny wings. They don't maneuver very well. They do a very specific surveillance mission, long endurance. These are fighter-like platforms. And so that's the distinction. Mm. And the things that are that are out on the market today, the XQ-58 Valkyrie from Kratos, that's the most mature. It's been flying around for many years, probably four or five years at this point. Okay. There's a few in the inventory doing uh, research and development. Andrew has has a platform called Fury that looks a little bit different. That is more fighter-like performance that's being looked at as far as the CCA. Uh, you have the MQ-28 Ghost Bat. That's a Boeing Australia platform that's been developed. Uh, that's doing R&D and experimentation flight ops down in Australia right now. That's been flying around for a few years. General Atomics has a oh, yeah. Gambit or something? Yeah, so General Atomics has Gambit. That's in an R&D program right yeah. now. I have a common core. Think of an airplane with Legos. Okay. So the tube is the same. The motor is the same. The avionics is the same. And I can change the wings. Oh. 
to do different things because the airfoil kind of determines if I'm going to go fast, my bleed rate, my endurance, you know, based on lift. And so it's a it's an interesting concept. Again, it's very modular. It's like Legos. Legos or maybe like a Barbie. You can accessorize. You have Barbies? I, I don't have any daughters, <laughs> but I might have, have some Mr. Barbies. Mr. Potato Head. I thought you were going with <laughs> oh, that. Mr. Potato Head. Okay, cool. Yeah, General Atomics is right here in San Diego, and uh, I know they're pretty involved in the space and a lot of other stuff. So I'll give it to them. If you haven't had them on the show, they're, they've been uh, obviously like – very crucial and critical to operations in the Middle East for the past you know, generation. Yeah. They've been doing a very good job of trying to get out of how they've been painted, honestly. So th- they've, uh, they've had a lot of investments into their own autonomy and, and AI uh, pilots and as well as the, the Gambit. There's some other stuff they have, the long shot, which is a, think of like a flying missile rail. So I can shoot a drone off of a, let's call it a bomber, and then the drone itself has missiles and it oh, deploys wow. those. Well, I mean, right, with technology going so fast today, I, I've said on the show before, every time I turn around, something I thought I knew is totally upside down because either yeah. technology or AI or machine learning or something else. So it's hard to keep up. In preparing for today, you sent me a term that I had to look up, and I think you got a link to it as well, called affordable mass. Talk about that, and then how does that play into this idea with these CCAs? So affordable mass is one of the Air Force's key talking points about why they want to invest in CCAs and do the rapid experimentation that they're doing right now. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We can't afford to buy our way out of the problem, as the Air Force describes it. So we've we've gotten to this place that we're making once-in-a-generation decisions on programs. These programs, like F-35, it's a 70-year program of record. And so I'm actually like picking winners and losers for multi generations. And so if you if you don't win the program, you're kind of out of the game. Like there's not going to be another fighter program. There's second, third order effects of that. So the decisions, and this is what's different about this program. They're actually bringing in industry and thinking about how to structure the program in a way that can reinvigorate the defense aeronautics industry both in a platform, but propulsion, subsystems, and then obviously the autonomy is a big part of that, uh, which is new. Uh, so that's kind of what they're, they're thinking, is if we can reinvigorate the industrial base, we have more opportunities, it'll actually end up with a better product for the warfighter at a lower price point. So that competition is going gonna, is gonna to create that. And that's something that's kind of been uh, lacking for the past 20 years or so in the defense industry. So in other words, if one of the large industry leaders wins this contract, it's not just they lock it up and take their winnings home. Other companies can still sort of be involved in some of the ancillary parts of it or payload or... There is a consortium of, uh, of, of platform providers, subsystems, and autonomy, uh, all in working groups that are kind of working together. They have obviously their own proposals and things that they're working, but the Air Force is not betting on one horse. They actually have a strategy, which is different than, than a lot of, uh, I, I say the Air Force, but the Navy has some efforts sure. going on as well. So yeah. does the Marine Corps. Yeah. Speaking from the Air Force is kind of the, the biggest, nearest uh, customer right now uh, that's kind of driving this forward. Gotcha. Well, is this tied into at all? Remember there was um, some sort of competition, I think DARPA put on a few years back, where they had a probably one of your peers, a fighter pilot and I think a simulator, and he was fighting AI, I guess. And I guess the machine won every time. And of course, there was always nuance to everything we ever hear in the news. But is AI about to have its day? And can we make Terminator jokes? I mean, where are we at with how good is it going to be? And, and what does that mean for manned aircraft? And of course, I hate to be parochial, but I mean, I had an awesome experience. And if any of my kids or friends want to do it, I'd you know, love for them to do it. But I also don't want to keep manned fighters around just because that's what we did, right? We don't want to still have yeah. bows and arrows and armor. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so where are we at with the machine learning, the AI compared to manned? The thing that you're talking about was the Alpha Dogfight, and okay. uh, the company I work for actually was involved in that. They actually won it, <laughs> uh, interestingly enough. <laughs> okay. That program, although it it you saw it on on YouTube or it was televised and it had the press coverage, probably th- almost three years ago now. It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, that program is still going. Uh, it's moved to Live Flight, so I can't talk too much more about it. But I'll say that there's Live Flight things going on from that program right now. It is making uh, game changing things that are going on right now. I'll leave it to the uh, the Pentagon to make the announcements when it sees fit. Yeah. Lots of groundbreaking things that happened in the past six months, past three months. So it is continually charting new territory of the art of the possible. Interesting. And is it just 
that a machine can think faster than a human or is it also it can withstand more G's, right? Because get me to about nine back in the old days, <laughs> not so much today probably, but you know, human wise, that's pretty much it. But can we make these pull 12, 15? What is it besides just those two? Or is yeah, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one example okay. uh, to illustrate. When you're flying, you think about, you have your hands on throttle and stick, mm -hmm. right? People who don't realize this when you're flying, you're making micro adjustments that on the surface, when you look outside, looks nice and smooth. Right. But but in reality, you're actually making like micro adjustments all the time. So think about that. But now I have the AI pilot and it's making 20, 50, 100 corrections a second. That's really what they kind of run at. So depending on the architecture, we've run them up to like 100 hertz. So 100 times a second, they're making these corrections. Mm -hmm. And so when it translates into, and these are, again, very, very precise corrections happening very, very, very fast. So think about what you, again, trying to fly like in fingertip or close formation, but being like perfect, right? If you apply that to like an AI pilot in a dogfight trying to gun someone, it is the smoothest most perfect transition to the gun was pulling the gun with the optimal lead in the plane of motion. Fire at the right time. Firing, firing at the right time. The right stop time. firing. It's it yeah. is so smooth. Huh. It looks like unfair because of those micro corrections and the algorithm is just trying to continually refine it and get it back on course. Huh. It's pretty amazing to watch. Okay, am I on to anything about the performance as well? Are we are we building aircraft conceivably that are going to pull far more than nine G? I mean, they could, right? I mean, there's got to be a reason for it. Mm -hmm. So 9G, there's a whole history of like where 9Gs came from. Uh, it could pull more. Whether or not it needs to is, is really the opportunity. There is a future, I would contend. You probably know this from surface-to-air missiles. We talk about 9Gs as a fighter. The missiles that we shoot are pulling 40 to 50 Gs. The air defense missiles that are coming at fighters and bombers, you know, those are pulling like 60 to 80 Gs. It is not fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're also going very fast. So speed yeah. and G are kind of, you know, linked a little bit. Yeah. There are, I would say, probably some future offensive decoys that you could do that are that are very, very high maneuvering that could outmaneuver missiles uh, as a means to kind of penetrate into denied airspace and things like that. Those are future concepts. But for CCAs, probably not needed. That's really yeah. not the value. How do we foresee the, I don't know if you want to call it tethering or the employment of something like this? Because if they had me on some panel somewhere, I would probably think of this from my very usual paradigm of, okay, I'm going to be out there and uh, this is what I could use because I'm bad at this or I know this is a great threat to my life. But I feel like this is really almost, hey, wipe the slate clean. If we need to either establish local air superiority or maybe it's not just air to air, maybe it's air to surface or whatever. We really have to start, I feel like, with a blank slate here and say, well, what is it we want to do? And then maybe work backwards from that. But are the, I assume those conversations are happening. And what does it mean in the near term for if 10 years from now, I know nobody can obviously predict the future, but when the first one of these is operational, do we know yet what it's going to look like? Is it going to fly next to you necessarily in your F-15 because you're in the back seat to control it? Or can I also have it in my F-18 and maybe I, as a single seat guy, can fly it. So I know there's a lot yeah. there. Oh, go, yeah. go with that wherever you want. But Okay. I'll stick to the military's talking points uh, okay. so I don't get out in front of what they're doing. So right. uh, what I can say is that it is not to replace the human, which is what you were talking about before, mm -hmm. is to augment the human in a way, again, that has that synergy. We talked about the synergy from a two-person cockpit from you know, the 80s and 90s. Right. It's the same kind of concept. So I'll take a little bit of a detour, if, if you will, real quick. Uh, have you ever heard of advanced chess? I've heard of chess, and I've heard of the word advanced, but not Yeah, it's not just like advanced. It's Yeah, you think it's like just, oh, it's just better chess, right? Like, okay. well, no, it's kind of a misnomer what it is. So advanced chess is when you use a human to make decisions, but it's augmented by a computer that's running in all the permutations of possibilities. And what are your chances of success if I make this move versus that move? It's almost like the that is a Doctor Strange when he, he at the, the Avengers movie he kind of goes through the alternate futures. There's 14 million right. f futures. There's only one. <laughs> so the computer's doing that, and then it's up to the human based on the strategy if they want to execute that recommendation. So that's advanced chess. That's been going on since the 90s. And interestingly, the guy who invented it was a guy, a man named uh, Gary Kasparov, who was like the grandmaster of chess in the 90s. He was famous for beating Deep Blue, and then the next year lost to it, and then 
retired because he's like, he That's invented it. advanced chess and uh-huh. then got out of professional chess because he saw like the, the synergy of having the man and machine team together is more powerful than either a machine only or a human only solution. Huh. I think of it as that advanced chess kind of analogy. So when you go back to CCAs, we don't want to replace the the F-35 or F-22 or the next generation, the, your sixth generation. So the talking points are we want to put a few of these loyal wingmen. That's why this is where the term came from. I have loyal wingmen that are going to go with my flight lead, which is a human. And we're going to have that advanced chest synergy that we talked about and execute a mission together. And those missions are right now the well-defined. Uh, so I can tell you, uh, because it's been public, the Air Force mission is called man-on-man teaming, that loyal wingman. That is a counter-air mission. Uh, there's other th- stuff being pursued by the other services and won't get into that today, but that's kind of what we our bread and butter, what everyone's kind of focused on. Again, because the Air Force has been so vocal and kind of leading the way, they're gonna buy thousands of these things. How do we actually bed them down? How do we train and integrate? And so because it's that man-on-man teaming, that synergy that they're trying to achieve, it drives all kinds of questions about readiness and day-to-day training. What does a fighter squadron look like? So it's mm-hmm. it's driving all of the right questions, which is really what you want to be having those conversations now before they show up, right? You don't want them to show up and go, well, I don't know what to do with it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Well, I guess... When I come back to you with your two analogies, why would Iron Man do anything other than the finger from Doctor Strange? <laughs> why would, and I'm not good at chess, but why would I do anything other than what the machine, if I'm partnered with it playing against you, why would I do anything other than what it suggests if it can look at all the permutations? And maybe the answer to my question is maybe I know something that's not factored into the assumptions of the machine, whether it's, hey, we're about to end hostilities tomorrow, or we have countries uh, nearby and we don't want wreckage to fall on the wrong side. I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm just curious, why would we do anything other than what the machines tell us if they, in fact, are looking at all the possible options and are presenting the best? Catastrophic success. That's probably the first thing that comes to mind. At the end of the day, war is an extension of politics. There's, There's some reason that a conflict started. A conflict ends when you have a path to peace. If you look at different strategies, whether it's attrition, annihilation, exhaustion, there's all kinds of different strategies you execute. Mm-hmm. At the tactical level, if all you want it to do is win and it's going to go out and just devastate, you could actually lead to uh, a response that you did not want at the strategic level. So instead of giving up, I'm just going to launch a nuclear weapon or something, right, as a last resort. So that's catastrophic success. I was so successful that I actually elicited the wrong response that I was trying to get out of the adversary. Hmm. It's an interesting discussion about where the human and the art of war belong Mm -hmm. in really a technology discussion. Yeah. Could that also play into if we win, we don't want the country, or maybe if it's still peer-to-peer, to be so devastated that there's not an opportunity to build back something? I don't know. I'm not a historian, but wasn't that kind of sort of Part of the point in World War II on both sides of the Pacific and the Atlantic was let's not – it was firebombing and all that, but it also wasn't complete annihilation. No, that's right. Like World War One was, you know, ultimate devastation without a real good plan and thinking afterwards. Right. It was just – it was, you know, live in the moment. World War II learned those lessons, and this is why in the post-war – this is what turned Germany and Japan into the like in- industrial nations that they are today. It was actually the post-war rebuilding of yeah. their economies. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if, again, in a few years, let's say, uh, if you and I are magically back in flight suits uh, (laughs) and we're going to go out and and do this, how? I mean, uh, as much as we can imagine the future, is is this thing going to be sitting in Marshall, as we'd call it, in the Navy, ready to go when I go? And then it sort of avatar connects to me somehow with, you know, uh, and then off we go together and it just follows me around and I can program it ahead of time. I mean, or is it going to be launched off a rail with a JADO assist of some sort? I mean, (laughs) I don't know. How uh, granular can we get here? Are we looking at that yet? I think it's a little bit of a Chinese menu right now because if your your CCAs, like the the Valkyrie that we talked about earlier, that Mm -hmm. is runway independent. There's conventional launch and recovery ones. There's going to be carrier ones. And you probably speak to it more than I can from carrier aviation, but the future carrier air wing, their their vision is 60% unmanned and then 40% manned. So that 60-40 split, that's a pretty visionary statement. That's 
that's, I mean, again, it's a huge paradigm shift from where it's been historically in the 100 plus years that we've had aircraft carriers. So, okay, so I'm not going to be physically connected to this. I assume it's all going to be radio frequency or some sort of signal, but can it be programmed in advance? Like, hey, whatever I'm doing, a fighter can maneuver pretty aggressively, but I have to think it could be told to don't ever get closer than this, but don't get further than that. So it could probably mirror me if I'm, if I'm flying around aggressively. The easiest way to, to comprehend it is think of it as a wingman. So you're going to clear your wingman for formation. How do you do that? You communicate with them, whether it's through a, a wing rock or a porpoise, the tactical uh, with the stick, or you make a radio call. Hand There's some signal. way you have to keep or hand signal. You have to communicate to them, right? right? It's just the conduit of the communication is different. But at the end of the day, you're telling it what to do. It's going to go do what you told it to do. And that's part of the development for the autonomy part of that is building in all of those foundations from a pilot perspective. What are the different formations? What are the training rules? Where's my safety bubble? Like, no matter what, don't ever get closer than 500 feet from me. Like, please, I don't want you that close. I don't need you that close. Mm -hmm. Don't get further than this because now I have issues of mutual support. I may need you. Those kinds of things are all the dynamics whether like the tactical considerations, the tech admin considerations, those are all the things that are being built into the autonomy. So when they do show up, it's like, hey, this is kind of like having a wingman, uh, a loyal wingman, right? So it goes back to feeding into the, into the branding of it. Uh, it's very, very important that the technology is built from the operator perspective. So the pilot has to know what the autonomy is doing and what it can expect it to do because it has to trust it. And if it doesn't trust it, none of this stuff is going to work. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So I have to think, and I tend to focus, by the way, on the granular stuff here, so bear with me. But again, if I'm out flying, let's say, with a loyal wingman and I've got so many missiles and it's got so many missiles, can I expect that if I want to employ, I should employ that one's missiles first. If I'm going to get shot at, I would like it to be a bigger beacon to whatever's targeting me. I guess fuel is not really an issue, but I don't know. Are, are they looking at use it first, possibly almost maybe as a decoy as well if, if uh, we're getting targeted, whether it's air-to-air -air or surface-to-air? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, without, without getting too much into it, if, yeah. you, if you have that a mass that's up in the air, you want to have a signal so whether through your, your narrative, hey, these all have weapons, they'll have sensors, they can all shoot you, therefore you must honor this picture, right? It's like when, you, uh, when you're flying the Super Hornet and you have uh, like strikers, red air strikers, like a flogger or something. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I know it's not going to shoot me down. I'm just going to go intercept it and, you know, gun it, right? <laughs> What's it going to do? <laughs> shoot me back? <laughs> but if you don't know, you have to honor that threat. And so a big part of this is like, you know, without getting too much, what can they do? What can't they do in those specifics? That little bit of strategic ambiguity is a way that you can actually bolster deterrence because you don't know which ones have what weapons or sensors and what they're capable and limitations are. And I have different types of CCAs and I have them all mixed with augmented by manned fighters. Again, you have that affordable intelligent mass that's up there in the air and you have to honor that threat. Hmm. So that's really, again, without getting into the details of tactics, yeah. and there's a lot of tactics being explored right now where you can put them in yeah. front and just have the, the man guy just sit in the cap and just kind of like direct them all and like go ahead and fight the war from his cockpit in the hold. Uh, or he can, you know, put him, put him on his left and right and, you know, line of breast and just go, let's wall it up and go downtown. So there's, there's a lot of things that are being explored. It's, it's, it's really interesting. It's yeah. a great time. I get the sense that you have access to about 100 things you could tell me, but I can only get a peek of maybe three, it sounds like, because I mean, obviously, I'm not looking to get you yeah. in trouble with whatever your uh, day job is, but a lot of it, too, though, right, is maybe what first mover advantage, or maybe just hey, these are the thoughts we've had, or what the limitations we've experienced. So, we're not ready to just make that totally public because then now we have to account for however they're going to react to that. I'm not trying to be too coy, but a big part of it is, you know, uh, I, I'm not in there for some retired. Yeah. I am part of a team of many different companies that is helping the Air Force trying to figure out what it wants to do and where the biggest value proposition is, the biggest bang for the buck on the timelines that matter. Uh, those are the things that are all being worked, and and I don't want to speak out of turn, honestly, from, sure. from the Air Force. And right? I'm not, like I said before, yeah. trying to get yeah. you in any kind <laughs> of hot water, yeah. but... So when I think back to, again, when I was an active fighter pilot, we would do on any given day, maybe a, 
OCA, offensive counter error, or flip the script. Maybe they're coming after me and now I'm just defending whether it's the ship or a base or whatever, or maybe somebody on the ground. Uh, we might do an interdiction and we're bombing. We might do surface suppression or suppression of enemy air defenses. Is the table wide open for the missions for these CCS? Counter air, like I said, is the first uh, use case. It has a has a specific uh, use case for that. Uh, but after that, uh, the foundations are extensible to other things, whether it's have a protection, uh, so I'm protecting the tankers, or the AWACS or Wedgetail, whatever mm -hmm. they end up getting, or the Hawkeye, or uh, fleet air defense, air refueling, right? Mm -hmm. So the MQ-20, uh, MQ-25 doing that right now, the Stingray, yep. which doesn't have autonomy yet. <laughs> so it's kind of like an MQ-9, but looks different. That's kind of how it's operated. But yeah, the extensibility, and when you zoom out, we said in the very beginning, we're going to call the CCAs through the whole discussion. I'm going to take that back right now. Okay. So, <laughs> so CCA, the Collaborative Combat Aircraft, is the, the fighter type version. Uh -huh. When you zoom out, the portfolio of this bigger initiative that the Air Force was working is called Autonomous Collaborative Platforms. So I can use them for logistics and mobility. I can use them for search and recovery. I can use them for just strike, so bombers, think very long endurance, B-21 type things, but unmanned. So there's different things. Again, the vehicle determines kind of physics, what you want to do with it, and then you build the autonomy and put the sensors and subsystems to do it. Mm -hmm. So ACP is kind of the big thing. CCA is the fighter type okay. thing. Okay, subset. Yeah. Okay. Where are we at with whether it's building or testing or, I mean, at some point we'll have to educate people. Where are we today? Behind. <laughs> yeah? Behind. Well, let so, me ask you that. I, actually, is that is someone else doing this that we should be concerned about or just that we feel like the opportunity has been missed? That's a great question. I think about that. There's it's, there's a lot of concurrency in, in believing in the technology that it's mature enough to put actual money into it. So for years, there was more hype than dollars in a lot of these programs that you saw, uh, that you see coming out of the press from the Pentagon and DARPA. Now there's actually real dollars in real programs. And so now turning turning kind of the the marketing and the glossy brochure into something that's real, it turns out is actually hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in that process, a lot of the meetings I attend, we run into a lot of disconnects and just education. Uh, and that goes back to trust. So imagine, and you were at Top Gun for a while, so imagine that you went to Top Gun and no one had any idea how a radar worked. And you brief this mission, you go, these symbols are going to show up on your display. And then you're just going to shoot the symbols. And those symbols represent things that are like, Things you can't see, you just have to trust me that they're way, way, way out there. And I have no concept of what a radar is. How successfully you think that mission's going to be? Uh, not very. Not very, <laughs> right? So I think about as a radar, again, as, as your kind of analogy, you have to have a enough of a working understanding of radar theory, enough of how the system algorithms work. Here are the capabilities. Here are the mode settings. Here's when you want to use this. Here are the limitations to then go, okay, now I want to go use this in the sim. I'm going to go use it in training. And now I build my confidence using that system. It's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So the training curriculum, I imagine there'll be a day when you go to Top Gun or the Air Force Weapons School, and there will be an academics on here is how AI pilots work. And you go, oh, that'd be great. That doesn't exist right now. So there's not an actual like training curriculum to even start educating the force. Uh, the Air Force has some efforts, but they're they're kind of broad brush educational. They're not actually driving at like the, the nuances that as a tactician, mm -hmm. all the hundred questions that you would have, <laughs> it's not to that yet. There is an effort called the uh, Experimental Operations Unit that's being stood up by the Air Force uh, this year uh, to start to get after that. Mm. That's kind of a cool name. Sounds like a SEAL Team 6 type of thing. Yeah. All right, good. Well, so when this starts getting close, do you see barriers to adaptation? For example, uh, your buddies Cinco and Billy Flynn came on the show and talked about the uh, collision avoidance ground GCAS, I guess, right? Yep. Auto GCAS. And how a lot of pilots are like, no, I don't want that. Do you foresee something like that here? Is there going to need to be some sort of sales or, or conversion, if you will, uh, to the existing cadre of fighter pilots? So I'm glad you brought that up. So GCAS, I can't remember the actual number, but it's something like 15 years, 15 to 20 years. So call it 20, we'll round up. For 20 years, the technology has existed to save lives. For 20 years, the pilots who would have benefited from the technology to save their lives resisted it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're an F-16 guy, like you don't fly, like you code through the jet, you don't fly without it. Like, no, it's not working. I'm not flying. Mm -hmm. So the lessons learned of, of why the, the community was so resistant and then what, what was the thing that flipped the script that 
created by them. Those are the things that I hope that the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps are all bringing back. And there's a lot of good conversations about using that uh, inside discussions. That is a great example of what not to do <laughs> to integrate technology. And it's something that's actually going to benefit the human. Very cool. All right, Paco, I would like to pivot to a phase of the interview, if you don't mind, where I told the folks that support the show on Patreon, which is great, keeps our lights on and cameras rolling, that I was going to sit down with you. And I said, I think we're going to talk about Loyal Wingman. That's what I was still calling it because I didn't know what to call it. And uh, But I did send them some of the stuff you sent me and had them do their own research. So hopefully these will all be in all right. line with what we're talking about today. And uh, they posed these questions for me to put to you. So all right, let's the do it. first is from uh, patron Michael Tenish, And he says, I love this question, by the way, but it's, it's kind of interesting. Do we still need a manned fighter in the air at all? Or can't surveillance be carried out from the ground in a similar way to a drone? There's a lot to that. I even feel like there's some assumptions in that. But at any rate, taking that at its value, do we still need a manned fighter? Can't surveillance be carried out on the ground similar to a drone? Ground surveillance, curvature of the earth is a big, big yeah. uh, drawback. So that it has a role to play. It's not that end all be all. The second part of the question, I, do, do you, do, need you do need them. You, yeah. if, you do need them. At, at the end of the day, what we're talking about now in the in the technology horizon that we've been talking about, uh, we want these AI pilots and CCAs to augment humans. Mm -hmm. The easiest way you think about it is uh, perception, cognition, and then actions. And so the magic right now of the human, again, that strategy, the art of war, and this is in that cognition. Mm -hmm. And so we will need a human in the loop for the foreseeable future to do these kinds of things. Yeah. Well, and that is obviously a much larger conversation, right? As far as do we want machines only to be doing our fighting for us? Yeah. Uh, this is kind of weird maybe, but like I'm not a huge fan of like DoorDash and some of these other, because like, and I don't disparage <laughs> people who do, but the point is I want to leave the cave and, and go out and club something and bring it back and cook it, right? And I'm a little bit fearful that I can just basically sit on my couch and like, oh, I'm hungry now. Boom, push a button and food shows up and now I'm pushing my TV or whatever. And, oh, I don't like that person. Fight, you know, food, fight. Like, I don't know. I, I, again, maybe we don't need to go here, but I feel like this is sort of redefining humanity is if we're just going to sit back and all the machines are going to go out and do our fighting, I don't know, what have we accomplished? Yeah, I, I think we're jumping, you know, a, a generation ahead when mm -hmm. we get when we have that discussion. I think right now it's how do we integrate that advanced chess? How do we have that synergy? Now, later, when you have uh, what we would call untethered operations, so instead of I have a flight lead and call it three wingmen that are my loyal wingmen, mm -hmm. and we all fight together, we integrate, maybe I'm the strike package commander and my entire strike package is on man, and I say execute the mission. And now that whole thing is going. So when you look at the will to fight, not just the means to fight, but the will to fight, mm -hmm. you see that going on in Ukraine right now, is it's a battle of wills. And you know, Ukraine's will is what's keeping it going. Now, when you you have an interesting conversation, when you remove that from the conflict and it's just committing hardware and software against other people's hardware and software. Again, why you're fighting and then the art of war is then more <laughs> an extension of politics and yeah. uh, you can get into, you know, the Thucydides and all kinds of stuff. Way above, my, <laughs> way above. Way above my pay grade. <laughs> Maybe to Michael's point about ground surveillance, I mean, right, we have folks in, like you said, Nevada that are flying unmanned aerial systems on the other side of the world and bouncing the signal off satellites or whatever they're doing to do that. So maybe that was his point. But all right, so you make a case for manned fighters for a while yet. Even our kids and maybe grandkids will have a cockpit if they if they want one. Our kids, grandkids, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All right, so one more generation. <laughs> all right, next question is from Derek Burney, who says, how can we be sure that control of the, he's calling it a UAS, but let's call it CCA, will not be lost. Satellite, I love this, satellite and data links can be lost. Laser may be difficult depending on atmospheric conditions. Of course, in case of a lost communication from the controlling aircraft, maybe the CCA would know to return to a pre-planned orbit or back to the carrier or the base. So I was in a war game probably six months, oh, last year, six months ago, something like that. And this actually came up. And it was, it was what level of autonomy do you want in these CCAs? And these loyal wingmen. And initially, the the working group, and this is uh, industry and military, like, well, I want the lowest level autonomy possible to execute the mission. That way I know I can trust it, which works great until you actually go fight a war because the first thing you're going to do is sever the comm links. 
So as soon as they start com jamming you, your intelligent, affordable mass is now gone because they're completely ineffective in combat. If also, if if I turn on a communication jammer and I negate the entire force package of the you know of why we have CCAs in the first place, that would be a huge vulnerability, mm-hmm. right? So that conversation evolved into like, well, I need I, I need to have an autonomy that can kind of level up and level down when it needs to. So when you get into I'm going to commit these CCAs, I have my man on man teaming concept. I am now in a contested environment, in this case, Spectrum, and I sever those comm links. Can the CCAs execute the thing that I wanted it to do with an acceptable level of risk, shot doctrine, et cetera, and then find a way to, to get out of that comms denied environment and reestablish communications, whether it's go back to a goalie cap or lost link profile is what you commonly hear with like the Reapers. Uh, they don't just you know, turn around and go home. They usually go to a place and hold for a while, and then we get to a certain fuel state. Okay, now I have to go home. Mm-hmm. And so all of those things are kind of being discussed right now. Mm. That makes sense. All right, Joe Kunzler wants to know, could we just use Loyal Wingman to support a FAC-A or JTAC, which are Ford Air Controller Airborne or Joint Terminal Attack Controller, and then fly back after dropping ordnance? I think this could reduce the carrier air wing, if so. We've already talked about the second part of Joe's question. What do you think about the first part? Yes. And this is, uh, so the near term, this is exactly why, if, if people aren't tracking, this is exactly why the Marine Corps is buying MQ-9s. So they're standing up squadrons, they're buying 20 MQ-9s hmm. to do that. And that was driven off of like, I want long endurance, persistent ISR with a strike capability organic to my forward team. So I can deploy with a JTAC on the ground. I've got Marine air support and uh, with an MQ-9 overhead to provide that. So that's absolutely within the realm of the possible. In the future, there's other things being looked at where if I remove the GCS, can I have a JTAC control the MQ-9? There's actually an interesting, probably six or seven years ago now, there was a DARPA project that actually had a JTAC. It was data linked to an A-10 and it was controlling the A-10 sensors and weapons. And the pilot was just orbiting and it was very, very disorienting to the JTAC on the ground. This is just a, a, you know, testing and evaluation. Mm -hmm. Not even the fog and frictional war. Like putting too much eggs in one basket is probably not a good thing. So you want you know resiliency and backup plans, and you know what's the simplest way we can execute a mission effectively through that fog and friction. Yeah. So I think there's a balance there, but there's definitely an opportunity. Yeah. And to Joe's question, you said earlier we're going to start with air interdiction, and then at some point down the road we're going to talk about possibly putting air to ground or air to surface ordnance on these vehicles. Yeah, there, there's definitely opportunities and a lot of other mission use cases. You know, one of them I'll just throw it out there is jamming. The Air Force is 100% reliant on the Navy yeah, for growlers for jamming because of some decisions that were made, you know, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. So those those types of things, I think you're going to see uh, the value of these platforms come in. Like, hey, I can get a growler like capability for a third of the cost. Like, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Nick Forster says, how do you envisage training with them? I foresee airspace slash regulation issues, but also validation of simulated weapons employment. Of course, this could all be done in the sim with these assets only being brought out in a time of need. And if you don't jump on that one, I will, because it's <laughs> you have to exercise it, not yeah. just in the sim or it's not going to work. But I have to think, and I remember reading you had forwarded me uh, one of the Air Force articles of a comment that was made. It's been almost a year now of, hey, we're going to build a thousand of these. Well, really 2,000. But yeah, we see that, right, we're already dealing with this. Uh, Amazon and others are trying to deliver stuff to our houses by mm-hmm. drones, and it's not so easy. But well, I don't know. To the next question, how do you foresee training to these and, and maybe handling some of those obstacles? The SIM has a very important aspect of it. It's not the solution. It's part of the solution. So I completely agree with you there. Yeah. And there, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Access to the platforms that don't exist yet, they're being built. They still have to go through testing and all kinds of stuff and validation. Even then, you have just the FAA, turns out, they actually own the airspace. And so getting just approvals to operate, there's very few places right now in the United States that you can operate, uh, even an MQ-9. Uh, now we're looking at things that are, you have a GCS, then you transfer it off to a fighter to control. That's a whole different paradigm that has not been addressed yet from the FAA. We'll get there. There's a lot of efforts being worked. But the way that I see it is that we go back to trust. Like, how do you trust the loyal wingmen? Mm-hmm. Well, how do you trust, you know, your fellow fighter pilots in your squadron? You train with them every day. Mm-hmm. So 
I would contend that the the AI pilot that that is in the vehicle that you're going to go out and fly on say Wednesday with is the same like line by line code. It's a digital twin AI pilot in the sim, and so you're flying with it on Monday. Oh. And that's one of the interesting things you can do once I've built this AI pilot. I can copy and paste it into an infinite number of platforms, whether it's virtual or live. And I can actually have that continuity of training and trust and that transferability into flight. So that's the thing that won't change. Like I know what to expect. I know what it can do. I know what it can't do. I know how to interact with it at the right time. And so you develop your own tactics. Would I have my own AI wingman? Would the one that flies, quote unquote, with me be different than the one that flies with you? It would all be the same, I would yeah. imagine. Uh, there's there's interesting things when you get into like the tech development. There's actually different personalities in the AI. But some are more aggressive, some aren't. You kind of fine tune to like, what does everyone actually want? That's the one we're going to feel because version control and everything else. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering as you were answering that though, before my follow-on question, is maybe I fly a slightly different than someone else and maybe AI would need to like learn the way I do things or maybe send commands or something, but maybe not. Maybe standardization will be more important. Yeah, I think sta- yeah, you have standards and then, uh, you know, point of deviation, yeah. as most standards are. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh, last question is from Justice Miller. And I like this one too. Isn't maintaining a drone more costly and complex than a manned fighter? I think the jury's out, but the ro- the real value proposition of this program is no. <laughs> <laughs> a fourth gen or a fifth gen fighter, it costs anywhere from... Fifteen to forty-five thousand dollars an hour to operate it. Then you have your phase maintenance, inspections, and your the amount of the logistical tooth to tail for that is, is pretty enormous. When you look at the CCAs, you're thinking about something that's like four thousand dollars an hour to operate. I don't have my phase maintenance and inspections because I don't have to fly the CCA to maintain a readiness requirement. The AI pilot can fly 100 times or one time. It's going to be exactly the same. <laughs> so it's going to fly for a purpose, and that purpose would be man-on-man teaming. You know, your, As you go through your X's and your training regime, mm-hmm. they're not there for them. They're there to support the human. Right. So I think the way that they get utilized and how many are going to be distributed across the squadron is going to then dictate the, the ultimate cost and the price point. But yeah. the cost, cost is a huge driver, the ability to buy and field the, the number of they need to for this affordable mass. And that was a follow-on question Justice Miller has is what happens if it gets too expensive? You know, and I guess the common answer to that is, well, you either figure out a way to make it more affordable or you cancel it. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing going yeah. on with the industry right now because it's, uh, it's like it's high tech. It doesn't necessarily be high price. Yeah. <laughs> but is it safe to assume that this there's going to be a future for this? I mean, if it gets a little costly, I think we're going to probably figure out ways to pivot or save money or do what we got to do. But I'd almost, at this point, dare I say, don't see a future without this, because if we don't, then we're either putting more lives at risk or someone else will. And then the force on force of that is going to be untenable for our side. So I I don't know. It's just, I sometimes like to use the, hey, we started with bows and arrows and swords and armor and then tanks and fighters. And I mean, look where we are today compared to where we went. So it's just, is this one more step, if you'll? My opinion, yes. Failure is not an option and no is not an answer. And the reason is if the United States says no, there are so many other efforts going on in the world right now that are saying yes, Mm -hmm. whether it's the European 6th Gen Fighter Program. uh, So FCAS, you have GCAP, which is another one. They're they're all looking at man-on-man teaming. China, man-on-man teaming. Russia, man-on-man teaming. If the United States does not pursue it, then the question is, how do we negate everyone else's Affordable mass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why we're here talking about it today, because yeah. uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the next several years have in store and which platform, if any, uh, takes over. Maybe there'll be multiple from different manufacturers. So I think it'll be a very interesting future. What did I not ask you about either Loyal Wingman or CCAs that is germane to today's discussion? Because uh, this, I, I still wanted to ask you more you know, <laughs> beeps and squeaks on, on like, how do I make this thing do what I want it to do? But I guess a lot of that's still in development. But uh, what else is there? Trust. So the uh, last thing I want to leave on is uh, debrief and trust. So okay. The most important phase in a mission is not the planning, it's not the execution, it's always the debrief. Mm -hmm. So leaning forward with that kind of first principles approach is very, very important in this program to know like why did the the CCA do that thing 
And the conversations in industry have evolved a lot in the past year. If you asked a year ago, the analogy I would use is like, well, say you went and flew, you, you brief someone, say, Joe, you and I are going to go out and fly this mission. When you see this picture, make sure you turn left and then execute this tactic. You got it? Like, okay, turn left when you see this. Yep. And then we go out and fly the mission. We're flying alongside. That thing happens and you turn right. So when we come back, I don't go into the ready room and go, uh, hey, someone like, you know, fire him, right? Like, I don't know, just fire him, get him out of the squadron. Uh, I don't want to use him anymore. I don't trust Jello. No, we go and debrief, right? So then we go, why did you do that? What did you perceive? And through the course of that, it, you've probably seen this many, many times, and you're like, why did my wingman do that? I surely did not. No, it was usually me. Yeah. <laughs> why did he do that? Yeah. And then you come back in the debrief, and then you realize, like, oh, he was perceiving something I was not perceiving based on his actions. They were right based on his perception. I would not have known that had I not had a debrief. It's easy to do that. I mean, it's, it's somewhat an art and a science, but it's easier to do that when you have a human to talk to and you have a line of inquiry and you can ask questions, you can review the data. It's a different process to do that with an AI pilot, to ask those inquis inquisitive questions. How do we actually analyze what's going on? Why did you do what you're doing? Did you do the right thing? Did you do the, the right thing but do it wrong? So all of those different parts of the debrief are a huge part of this program that it's easy to glob on to the platform and maneuvering and how do I command it, but the debrief is where the magic's going to happen. I'm really, really excited to see the next year or two of how that's going to mature. Yeah. Well, and you use the word trust there, and a simpleton, which I am sometimes, might have thought what you meant was, well, how do I know this thing's not going to turn and shoot me down? Or how do I know it can't be hacked into? And now they can use it, uh, they being the adversary of the future, for nefarious means against their own forces. So obviously a lot of that yeah. just has to be hardened into the – and again, right, people who watch – Sci-fi movies, they're all about the machines turning on us. And I, you know, I bring it up because it's fun. But there's been some stories uh, that kind of get out there that are more uh, science fiction than fact. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like a military weapon system is not going to get to an operator without going through a rigorous developmental test and operational test evaluation. And that has what's called a VVNA to verification, validation, and uh, I don't know, analysis. And that has all the checks and balances to make sure that we can confidently field a weapon system that's going to do what it's supposed to do, when it's supposed to do it. And then we arm and equip the operators with the techniques, tactics, and procedures. And that's something that we learned from Vietnam, as you probably know. Here are the weapons. They all work. Trust us. And none of them actually worked. Yeah. Right? So that is a lesson that's a key part of this program as well is when you when you get something how do you know it works just like your radar you turn your radar on it's going to power up this this thing i don't know what it's doing it's spending 4 minutes doing like beeps and squeaks that i don't know but it says hey i'm ready to go and you go okay i'm ready to go and i i know with high certainty that it's going to serve me well during the mission there you go very cool well, this has been very uh, a masterclass, I will say. Thank you on this concept and subject. And man, of all the things you and I could have talked about today, uh, this was a fun one. So appreciate that. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the other things you do because you're not foreign to a microphone. Uh, <laughs> you've got some stuff you're doing. And and you really, by the way, hit a grand slam on something I tried to do for a while, which was, oh yeah, I got an audience. Maybe I'll get on MailChimp and get an audience and, uh, or I should say a, a newsletter list and we'll send them out stuff. But uh, why don't you talk about what you're doing and, and the effect it's having because it's the space you're in anyway, so you're the right guy to be doing it. Yeah, thanks. So I run The Merge, which is a predominant newsletter. Now I do somewhat of a podcast when I when I can. Okay. Uh, limited bandwith. I'm a, kind of an army of one. Um, so I put out a twice weekly kind of defense tech related uh, newsletter and, and it really started during COVID, but I started seeing like a lot of trends and movements in really, it started from the fighter pilot centric view with like different fighters, different weapons, different sensors. And then started looking at the domain and started looking at all the dependencies. There was a lot of things going on on in the defense tech space right now, uh, starting from about a few years ago. So I tried to figure out what was going on, and I tried to figure out how do I get the info, and nothing out there existed. So I started making this kind of for myself as a project, and then I was like, oh, I'll send it to a, you know, a few of my friends out of like a Facebook group. So it started as a couple hundred people, and then it's kind of grown from there. It helps me keep connected to what's going on and all the happenings in, in this type of space. Uh, it also happens, and I started it before my, my current job, before I retired. Uh, and when I retired out of the military, 
I decided, like, what do I want to do? What do I want to commit my time where I think is the best value add for the mission that I was mostly closely aligned with doing when I was in active duty? Mm-hmm. CCAs, autonomy, uh, AI pilots became that is that's the thing I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on that horse, and so I, I work uh, for a defense tech startup that's doing that right now. Uh, we got our hands in a lot of different interesting programs, not just Group Five, but uh, Group Three and some other stuff as well uh, that are really fascinating. My day job and my side uh, my side work with the merge or have a very strong overlap in a Venn diagram, and they kind of reinforce each other. Keeps me very connected of kind of what's going on. Gotcha. Well, we had uh, longtime listeners of the Fighter Pilot Podcast might remember we had a spinoff little show we tried to do like serial with a S-E-R, like where we took a story and told it over so many episodes, and we called it The Merge. <laughs> and uh, I think our friends at Authentic Media are still looking at maybe trying to do another season of that. Whether they'll call it something else or not, I don't know. Uh, but um, as far as I'm concerned, that's your name now, and uh, that's pretty <laughs> cool. And you brought a patch in. It's on the sound panel behind you there. Thank you very much. Where can people find The Merge, and uh, can they sign up? Is there a cost or? That's yep, completely free. Yep. I give you everything I know for free, right. 100% free. And where can they go? Themerge.co, that co. Okay. Themerge.co, not com. I couldn't afford the M. It's just co. <laughs> All right, fantastic. And then, of course, the podcast is wherever you get your podcasts. Yep, it's on YouTube. It's on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your pods. Okay. Just search The Merge, you'll find it. It's got a, got a raptor kind of flying out of a, I don't know, something or other. Cool. Yeah. All right. And if people want to, uh, is there a social media or can they follow you? Uh, where where can people uh, see more of what you're doing? Mostly on Instagram okay. right now, uh, but uh, I'm all, all the social channels, Twitter as well, or X, whatever you want to call it this week. Mm-hmm. Instagram, I actually lean into that a lot, mostly because uh, I can link what I'm talking about in the newsletter, yeah. put a picture or video on Instagram, and then I can hyperlink it back and forth so people can actually see what I'm talking about. It's growing, small, but growing. Yeah. yeah. My <laughs> Instagram for about the last year has plateaued and almost started to go down. And I think it's changing because I'm not doing enough uh, what reels, I guess they're calling it. Yeah. I just, I still put up just a static image and I guess people are yawning at me for that. Like you're so, you're so last year. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. All right. So the merge.co and on your podcast player and man, that's awesome. All right. Well, we have a tradition here on the fighter pilot podcast, uh, Michael Benitez with to ask about call signs Paco. Now we've had a Paco with a C never had a Paco with a K, but I haven't had some mm. Air Force folks on the show before who, you know, unless there's some alcohol or something involved, they'll often like to share their call signs. So what are you willing to uh, tell us here? I'm going to plead the fifth. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I'm going to plead the fifth. All right. Can we at least get this? Is it an acronym? It is an acronym. Okay. It All is right. an acronym, and it has to do with a squadron bar crawl and i'll just leave it at that Uh okay well maybe if we can get to know you better or if i put something other than water in our coffee mugs here next time we can uh, get that story out of you fair uh, enough thanks for coming to the circle air group studios here in san diego i guess you were coming into town for some business anyway yeah thanks uh, jello this is great this worked out and uh, i really enjoyed learning all about ccas today and hope we can maybe uh, get you on the show again yeah look forward to seeing what the feedback is thanks Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I still do every single time. Now, in case we had some jargon that you didn't understand, head on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary that explains commonly used military aviation terms. And while you're there, check out the merchandise and books that we have for sale, as well as the blog that we call Musings. So thanks for joining us this week here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long.